Good morning so far. Thank you for your questions. And I want a whole lot more, because our next speaker has decided that he doesn't want to give a presentation at all. He would like to just answer your questions, and perhaps a few pesky journalistic ones from me. Can we have um, chairs brought up? Yes, so that we can sit comfortably for the next half hour or so. Who is our next speaker? Well, we've been dropping tantalizing hints, haven't we? He's a titan of technology. I understand he's something of a rock star here in Norway. Because, <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> because um, he has plowed in his initial fortunes from the sale of, for instance, PayPal. Did you know this, this gentleman was behind PayPal, one of the co-founders? And instead of retiring to a comfortable um, lounger in the Caribbean and spending money on wonderful yachts, or perhaps he does that too, he's also spent three fortunes in three audacious businesses. Tesla needs no introduction to you. Space City, oh, sorry, Solar City is trying to put solar panels around the world, or at any rate, in all the hot and sunny parts of the world. And then we have SpaceX, which has the truly jaw-dropping mission of one day transporting us all to Mars. How is this man real? <laughs> well, we're going to find out for ourselves. His initials are EM. Please do send in your questions thick and fast. A big warm welcome to Elon Musk. <laughs> Make yourself comfortable, Elon. My gosh, we've got so many questions here already. Where do we start? Shall we start with Tesla? Should we do a bunch of Tesla questions? Is that good, <coughs> audience? Well, I thought I'd start off with a song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. Well, no, maybe I'll ask you this question. Rather than Tesla, I'm going to ask you this question, which is from me, not the audience. What exactly are you doing here? You know, this is an oil and gas conference. Why, why are you here? <laughs> well. Um, Norway has been very supportive of electric vehicles, and uh, uh, so I'm here in gratitude and appreciation for uh, what Norway's done for electric vehicles. Okay, so it's thank you to Norway, I think, yeah, from exactly. Elon Musk. Thank you to Norway, <laughs> exactly. So what is it about Norway, then? It's your second biggest market, I understand. It's third, actually, at this oh, point. Okay. Ooh, someone else snuck in there. China. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they have some demographic Maybe that's advantages. For you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what is it about Norway? Is it the government support, putting in all well, those power stations? What is it? I think it's a number of factors. Um, certainly, uh, Norway has a lot of incentives for electric vehicles, which are great. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's worth noting that, say, Denmark also has very strong incentives for electric vehicles, uh, but our sales are much greater in Norway than in, in Denmark. And I think in Norway, there's a core group of electric vehicle enthusiasts uh, who have really taken it upon themselves to pr promote electric vehicles and have done an amazing job. And, um, and as a result, that, that has uh, made Tesla sales in Norway really, really great. Um, as, I understand uh, there's one gentleman who, yeah. who owns more, no, more EVs than any of your customers around the world. Uh, and yeah, that's somewhere right. in Norway, yes? It, yes, he's in Norvik. Uh, He's a Norvik. Yeah. Okay. And how many? <laughs> how many does he own? Do you remember? Uh, that, Are you that's counting? above the. That's above the Arctic Circle, by the way. Um, and he, I believe, he owns. I don't know, twelve or maybe fourteen now. Uh, so his name is Jens Kratholm, and uh, he uh, he's a very nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> a very nice guy. So we have a we have a question here from the audience, which is, when is your next mass market car going to be ready? Because your current one right. is uh, roughly what in price? Well, our current one is, in, in US dollars, it's about $70,000. So it is a premium car. Um, and then we, we're, we're coming out with uh, an SUV version um, called the X. Uh, that's coming out next year. But also, that's on the same platform, so it's about the same cost. Um, the, the car that we, we're lo really looking forward to bringing to market is called the, uh, the Model 3. Um, and that's intended to be a mass market, long range electric vehicle. It's the car that um, I, I wanted to bring out from the very beginning, but it just takes a bit of time to iterate the technology and compute. How long? Because I think uh, the launch yeah. date has been pushed back and back a bit, eh? Well, it's, uh, we're hoping for about uh, two and a half to three years. Um, and contingent okay. upon that is completion of this very big battery factory called the Gigafactory that we're building. So tell us about that. Sure. So the 
in order to make a lot of electric cars, you need a lot of batteries. And um, the, the lithium-ion lithium -ion battery capacity of the world, in terms of production capacity, is really not uh, big enough yet, uh, nor does it make the most advanced type of uh, batteries that, that we really need for long-range electric cars. So in order to solve that problem, we found there was really no choice but to build a really enormous factory um, called the Gigafactory. Uh, so named because we're targeting about uh, 50 gigawatt hours of output, which for battery energy storage is quite a big it's number. It's huge, yeah. yeah. And it sounds cool as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so are there any links, do you think, between the battery technology that you're investing in at the moment and renewables? I mean, would there be... Yes, yes absolutely, or, or absolutely. The stuff that you're developing is not just for cars? Can, are Correct. There some, yeah, oh, okay. In fact... Tell uh, us a bit more about that. Sure, so... Uh, uh, about a third of the output of the, the Gigafactory is intended as stationary storage, uh, primarily to be paired with renewables, but also to do grid buffering in non-renewable situations, um, so that you can operate the plants, uh, even if it's a hydrocarbon uh, energy plant, you can operate it close to its optimum and avoid having to sort of peak. Um, the, yeah, so I, I think we'll see really a very huge demand for stationary storage. Um, and this, this is really going to help out some of the more intermittent sources like wind uh, and solar. Um, and um, you know, it's worth noting, I'm not sure if people are aware of this, but it, 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 the world could be powered many times over by solar if you had enough uh, battery capacity to pair it with it. M many times, like... The world? I mean, obviously California, where you're no. based, but in Europe? Can you really say that in Europe? A thousand. <laughs> it's literally true. The, the amount of energy that, that reaches the Earth from the sun is staggeringly high. We have this enormous fusion generator in the sky uh, that, that is lobbing out vast amounts of energy. And I'm, I'm talking about just using land area. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. In fact, here's a little tidbit. Um, if you take a nuclear plant and you took its current output and compared that to just taking solar panels and putting solar panels on the, la on the area used by the nuclear power plant. Because these typically have a big keep out zone, you know, of about maybe five kilometers or there thereabouts, it, where, where building houses, you know, and, and dense, uh, you know, any kind of dense uh, office or, or housing space, usually people don't want to do that near a nu nuclear power <laughs> plant. Um, uh, so, there's, there's quite a big keep out zone. And when you factor the keep out zone into, into account, um, the solar panels put on that area will typically generate more power than the nuclear power plant. Yes, and that's not a conclusion just done by you. I know, you can just, it's very easy to do. <laughs> uh, it's, it, so, um, so, here's a question uh, from I'll give the you audience basic, then. If I, if I might, might sort of just do just a tidbit of math. Uh, the Collective <laughs> maths, 900 people, <laughs> mental <Tip> maths. <laughs> um, so um, uh, w one square kilometer is a million square meters. Uh -huh. um, and there's one kilowatt per square meter of solar energy. So on one square kilometer, there is a gigawatt of solar energy. Uh-huh. With okay. you so far. <laughs> With you so far. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I mean, if, if you wanted, I mean, you, you, you can get... And ergo, the nuclear power station doesn't give you the same. Is that the calculation? Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Okay, that so is, here, yes, um, but, but like, you could power the entire United States um, uh, with about, let's say, 150 to 200 square kilometers of solar panels. The entire United States. Take a corner of Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Not much going on there. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> There's not so even radio stations, okay? <laughs> so w the question from the audience then is, seeing that your, your big thrust into Tesla cars, which has taken off 10 years in, your big ambitions for solar power, what kind of a threat do you think you are to the oil and gas industry? Well, I don't think we're much of a threat. I mean, yet. You know, yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Um, uh, I, I mean, the, 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 the more obvious threat is that we're going to run out of uh, hydrocarbons to mine and burn. That, that's rather obvious. I mean, uh, it's but not a... It's no a, time soon, judging from the comments we've had this morning. Well, it depends on what soon means. 
Um, I mean, there's, it, it's, get, it's clearly getting harder and harder. Um, my understanding is that the cost of extraction is, is doubled, and in some cases tripled. Um, so it's, it's, it's getting harder and harder to find uh, hydrocarbons, and it's getting much more expensive to extract them. Um, and r really, we're just arguing about the when uh, hydrocarbons run out or become prohibitively expensive, not if. I mean, I don't think it is, there's anyone he here who would say there's a, it's an if, not a when. Uh, they will run out for sure. So, the, the th what, what will so you don't think? I mean, you are you know a tech guy, right? You're a physicist and an engineer. You call yourself the chief architect of yeah. The I, I tend to yes. do things from you don't sort of think physics the human standpoint. ingenuity and technology and resourcefulness will mean that we will still have abundant fossil fuel no, available. Not. I mean, this has been going on for <laughs> some time. They think you've reached the boundaries, and yet they find more. And you know, look at the whole shale gas revolution. You know, that was stuff that people said would never be able to be extracted. Th there are, there are ex time extensions on the game, but the game is going to come to an end. That should be s absolutely certain, obviously, frankly. Uh, but the. Uh, I mean, t t to be in non-renewables, and it's tautological, either it's renewable or it's not renewable. Um, so if you're in, in, in non-renewables, it, it's like being in, you're, you're stuck in a room where the oxygen is gradually depleting. And then outside, it's not. <laughs> so you want to get out that room. Um, and I think the, the, the ones that get out of the room sooner will be better off. Um, I mean, if you, if you uh, is that where the mission to Mars comes in? No. <laughs> Ironically, the, the rockets will use hydrocarbons. <laughs> Quite a bit, I think. <laughs> but, but, but the, <laughs> isn't the there an inherent contradiction then here in no, the project? No, there isn't. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, don't have any, I don't have any fundamental dislike of, of hydrocarbons. Um, I simply look at, at the future and say, what is the thing that will actually work? Um, it, and using a non-renewable resource um, obviously will not work. So we must find an alternative. But if, if, I, if, if there was a button I could press to stop all hydrocarbon usage today, I would not press it. You would not press of it? Of course not. OK. Did you expect him to say that? <laughs> you would not it press would, it, it because? It would cause human civilization to come to a halt. Every hospital would have to close down. That would be ridiculous. So it would be irresponsible to press that button. Um, but w w what, what does need to happen is to, if we can, accelerate the transition towards renewables. That's the sensible thing to do. Um, and. Um, you know, if you take, uh, say, uh, I'm going to use maybe two examples, uh, Saudi Arabia, since the uh, Saudi Aramco uh, president spoke here. The, uh, Saudi Arabia has an enormous amount of sunlight, and that, that, that will be there for billions of years, or well, at least one billion years until the sun eventually engulfs us, but a billion years, solid. <laughs> um, bit more maths there. <laughs> you've got a solid, solid billion years there. So... It, it seems that um, you know, in, investing in the, the, the solar resource is the thing that, that's really going to preserve the, the long-term future, not, not so much the oil and gas. I mean, that's, that's a temporary thing. W in, in the future, we'll look back, and by future, I'm not talking about super far in the future, I'm talking about towards the end of the century. We will look back on gasoline-powered cars the same way look, we look back on coal as sort of a quaint anachronism that's in a museum. That's the quote for you, members of the press at the back of the hall. Yeah, but it's true. I think there are some business models that we could perhaps all learn from. Um, and I've been trying to do some boning up, thinking, what is it that Elon is doing in his Tesla cars, for instance, and his solar city ventures, which seems so very different from the oil and gas sector, but which perhaps there is some commonality, some points of learning. And the thing that I want to ask you about is patents, patents as you call them. Yeah. Um, now, a few months ago, you decided to open them up, make them open source right. for a, 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 some key areas of Tesla card. What is no, the thinking all, all, behind them? all of our patents. Oh, all of them. Okay. Yeah. What is the thinking behind them? And is that something that perhaps the oil and gas industry should consider when developing things like, say, carbon storage and things like that? Very, very difficult new projects. Should they get together and just junk the patents? Um, yeah, I think patents are, I don't like patents personally. Um, you know, w when I was uh, first starting out developing technology, I got lots of patents and I thought this was a good thing. And then I sort of discovered that a patent was really like buying a lottery ticket to a lawsuit. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I'd rather not buy as many those tickets. Um, 
And um, you, you look at sort of the battle between Apple and Samsung, and who is really winning there? You know, the lawyers are winning, certainly, but, not, but neither of those two companies. Um, and in, in the case of, um, of Tesla, I, it, I, I thought, well, would Tesla ever sue some other car company if they were using our patents to try to make them stop making electric cars? We would never do such a thing. So why, why pretend that we would? But, and you're not just do, saying, re recognizing that internally as a de facto position. You're saying to the world, here, have them, go for it. Yeah. Yes, which is a different thing. That's going one stage further. Yeah. Yes, and that's not just because you think we're never going to sue them. It's presumably because you think there is some business advantage to it. No, right? I, I really don't. No? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if there is, let me know what it is. I'm not sure. <laughs> You know, I'm all ears. <laughs> Maybe it will somehow turn out to be uh, good. I don't know. But you boost um, the market. There's well, more I mean, investment I think, I think, uh, in, in charging stations. You know, everybody great. benefits. Great. You know, I mean, I hope there rising is. tide lifts all the boats. It's that argument, I, isn't it? I hope it? there is. That'd be nice. Um, I mean, we're not really trying to get relevant advantage, but maybe it can help lift the industry as a whole. Um, and I think uh, it you know, generated some goodwill, and I think maybe that goodwill is helpful. You never know whether it pays off. Okay. So there's an idea for all of you here at ONS. You know, think about patterns. Do we have to be quite so possessive about them, so, so kind of secretive? It's an idea. Yeah. I want to throw another thing at you. We haven't really spoken about space exploration very much yet. Okay. And we have a question from um, a young man called, let me see if I've got his name right, um, Gauter Mudson. I hope I've pronounced his name right. He's 37 years old, and he's saving up to go to Mars. Okay. Yes. And he says he has an, he's on average earnings, which is probably quite high here in Norway. And he says, how long is it going to take him before he'll be able to make this mission a reality? Well, I think I, the, the critical threshold is what's the cost of moving to Mars? Um, what's the ticket of, of, of for moving to Mars? And, and I, what, what's the thres threshold uh, ticket price below which a self-sustaining Martian colony would be established? Uh, and I suspect that is somewhere on the half a million dollar level. You know, so obviously we'd like to have it be lower. But I, I, I do see a path to being able to uh, offer uh, tickets for someone to move to Mars. Also, they get a free return ticket if they don't like it. <laughs> um, um, so it's you not know, sort of trapped there. Um, and, I, and I think if we can get that threshold below half a million dollars, you know, which is the price of a sort of middle class home in uh, many parts of the U.S., then... Uh, so you have to trade in your home? Yeah, well, you're moving to Mars. It's not a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the time span on this? Two, three, well, four think, decades? Think, uh, yeah, I think, I think we should be able to hopefully send the first people to Mars in about 12 years, and then it's going to take... 12 years? Haven't you brought that forward from your previous... No? no? Has it always been? Okay. 12 uh, years? Wow. Roughly. Um, and, uh, and then probably double that to get, again, to get to where the cost is reduced to the half million dollar level. So it's probably 25 years-ish. Okay. So that. it's, uh, it's I mean, it'll all get this is dependent yeah. on, obviously, technological advantage, uh, advances and yes. cost effectiveness. Now, you've yes. already uh, well, been you, able to yeah. put a number of vehicles into space, supplying right. NASA, let's supplying let's the International Space Station yes. with cargo. And your main bid was bringing down costs dramatically. Yes, slashing costs by, what, a factor of a third, well, it on half? What it's compared to, we're about, we're about a third to a quarter the price of Boeing and Lockheed, which are our domestic quarter competitors in the U.S., and uh, probably, I don't know, 60% uh, of the price of the Russians or the Chinese. Uh, and this is and you're based in California, many, which is yeah. not exactly a low cost part of the world. Our rockets are manufactured from scratch in, LA, in Los Angeles County. Um, so necessarily, is this cannot be a function of labor cost, because the labor cost is very high. So facing an audience of people who are grappling with costs, we heard um, Carla Del Fale talking about how cost of exploration has doubled in the last decade. We've been, it's something that's bubbling along here. What advice can you give them? How does one go about really reducing the costs of a venture? Well, you have to innovate. You have to do different things. And there has to be a, a tight feedback loop on innovation. And one of the things I think is advantageous for the way that SpaceX operates is that the engineering team and the production team are in the same facility. And there is good communication back and forth. 
So as the engineers see that they've designed something that is difficult to manufacture, they can adjust their design quickly to make it easier to build. Um, and and at, at the pace at which we're able to do new versions of the rocket is also much faster. So uh, innovation, just improving things, is, is key. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's actually it sounds lovely, and everyone talks a lot about innovation. There must be an but expectation of innovation. What, is it, what, what of can innovation. people take away from it? There has to be an expectation. Est establish an expectation of innovation, and the compensation structure must reflect that. Uh-huh. So you, you're basically incentivizing innovation and cost reduction. You have to incent it, yes. And do you have to do the Henry Ford thing, which is every year you just expect the price to come down <laughs> and the cost to come down, and that's just uh, a, it, a kind mean, of directive from above? No, it's, I mean, so th there needs to be an expectation of innovation. The, the compensation structure must reflect that. There must also be an allowance for failure, um, because uh, if you're trying something new, uh, necessarily that there's some chance it will not work. So if, if you punish people too much for failure, then they will respond accordingly, and the innovation you will get will be very incrementalist. Nobody's going to try anything bold for fear of getting fired or being, you know, uh, punished in some way. So the, there must be, a um, the, the risk reward must be balanced um, and, and, and favor taking uh, bold moves. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will not happen. So um, is your door open to members of the oil and gas industry to come and see what you've done, to really sure, engineer costs term. out of, hmm? uh, yeah, out, uh, out of SpaceX? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some limitations in SpaceX because it's considered an advanced weapons technology, but, um, the, but, but within, within the route bounds of what the US government will let us do, we're more than happy to show people around. Um, Fantastic, thank but, you. But I, I, I forgot, to, I, I was going to give two, two examples. One was Saudi Arabia, another one was, was Norway, because it seems that that's appropriate for given the, the venue. Like, Norway has tremendous uh, natural resources in terms of uh, hydropower, uh, also, I think wind and potentially geothermal, um, and I, I really, I think there's a huge opportunity there to expand uh, those those renewable sources uh, and provide that power uh, to the rest of Europe. Uh, so I think, um, I mean that 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 really I think would be a, a wise thing to do. And you need it really, don't you? Because we need to clear clean up power generation yeah, for yeah, yeah. EV cars sure. to be truly clean. You right. know, if they're still being powered from coal-fired power right. stations, then your EV product is not ultimately that clean, is it? Yeah, and uh, Norway, of course, or already has a lot of hydropower, um, but, I would, uh, but I think expanding, expanding upon that would be, would be wise. Going back to SpaceX, we have a question here from Christian Rangan, who sent it in on Twitter. What collaboration do you see between SpaceX and the current oil industry in space exploration, for instance, Asteroid mining? <laughs> Asteroid mining. Drilling on Mars? Um, there are commonalities? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, the, as, I as I alluded to earlier, the, I mean, rockets do, do burn hydrocarbons, uh, or they can burn hi just hydrogen as well, but um, the, the, the most likely Mars architecture that, that, I, that I think makes sense is a methane oxygen system. Um, so methane is the, the lowest cost uh, source fuel uh, on Earth. Um, and with rockets, you can't really make a rocket electric because it's got to react against something. Once it gets to vacuum, there's no air or land or water to react against. So you have to, uh, you have to burn something, really. Um, so the, the I, th I think a methane-based methane, methane -based system is going to be what makes the most sense. Um, once you get to Mars, uh, I think there will be some drilling activity, particularly if it to, to find out if we can get to uh, uh, underground lakes, like if, if to, to find liquid water, but you know, water that's sort of uh, heated by the, uh, the Mars central core. Um, that would make it a lot easier uh, to uh, build to, to, to uh, develop propellant on Mars. Mm -hmm. So, because critical to any uh, any Mars. Uh, colonization is the ability to generate fuel on Mars. You need to generate methane on Mars, which mm -hmm. you can do because Mars has a CO2 atmosphere and there is a lot of frozen H2O around. So you've got your CH4 and your O2. Um, and, uh, and, and, but having that propellant plant on Mars be efficient is critical to a Mars colony. So perhaps collaborations ahead. 
Um, I've got one last question which I'm going to sneak in briefly, and that is, what changes would you make if you were the CEO of an oil and gas major? Um, I would, Good I question. Would in, I would invest hell of heavily in, in renewables. Um, now, I mean, that may sound like a, an obvious thing to do, and, and there are some companies that are doing it. Uh, at, uh, Total um, made a huge investment in SunPower, um, and I think that, uh, that investment will pay, pay good dividends in the future. Um, but I, I think it's important to, to look at renewables and take it really seriously. I mean, let's don't, don't just put like the, the, the C or D team on it, put, put the A team on it. Um, are you listening, the <laughs> A team? Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you a personal question. Actually, it's from my son. He's 14, and his question to you is, what should he study in university to become a car engineer of the future? <laughs> should he do physics like you? I think physics or is Or should he do physics engineering? A, I think physics, physics and engineering are, I mean, if, if physics provides a good framework for thinking. It has the best framework for thinking, I, I believe, particularly for discovering things that are counterintuitive. Uh, and, uh, but then I think also studying a, a bit of engineering and um, also, I mean, I wouldn't completely ne neglect the humanities as well. I think history, <laughs> history is important. Uh, I think history is something everybody should study. Uh, there's lessons to be learned And if you were there. to go for one, I think there's only one boy. <laughs> one boy. My son. Okay. There's one of him. Yes. Physics. If you to go for one, so, you mean just he one wants major? a simple answer. Yes, he's 14. He wants a simple so, answer. I think probably the best choice is physics, honestly. Okay. Yeah. But he there speaks a physicist. You shouldn't just read physics, though. There's other things, too. <laughs> Elon Musk, it's been such a pleasure having you All right. here. Thanks giving for having us me. this wide-ranging view of the world yeah. and the universe. Thank you. Thank you for joining All us right. at ONS 2014. <laughs>